So if we're sitting down again in five years to talk about the success of the previous five years, what's likely happened, right? So how much further have we gone in immunotherapy just in straight up activating T cells either through adoptive cell therapy via genetic engineering to take peripheral blood lymphocytes and turn them into or engineer them into TIL. Let's put that as a category of therapy. Let's talk about other ways to identify checkpoints or uh, checkpoint inhibitors and or um, combat the tumor suppressor cells. So call that the sort of tumor suppressing environment, go after it. How much of it is going to be in the metabolic environment or the mm -hmm. kind of interstitial micro environment that's and, and targeting the hostility. Um, and then how much of it is going to be inducing mutagenesis. So yeah. again, you know, we, you and I spoke about this probably a couple of years ago and I ended up, I think it, I think I was able to keep it in the book. I know there's always so much pressure. You're trying to chop stuff out of the book. So I don't remember if this finally made it in, but I at least referenced one study that had taken patients, I think with lung cancer who were, you know, none of them had any PD-1 activity. And then a course of platinum based chemotherapy, all of a sudden rendered a subset of them to now be susceptible to it. In other words, using a conventional chemo increased immunosusceptibility, even though the conventional chemo itself wasn't particularly responsive. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, and again, there's lots of ways to, to go about doing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. paradoxically, you could almost imagine taking a cancer cell and exposing it to more mutation forming uh, insult. So, so, and again, I'm sure there's other ideas, but so, so yeah. keeping yeah. the time frame short, which is five years, yeah. What are we going to need to do to double the response rate, the durable response rate? Yeah, well, I th within a five-year horizon, I think what um, I'd say, well, this is, first let's look backwards briefly. Um, over the past eight years, we have exhaustively tried to find other gas pedals and brakes on immune cells, uh, CD-positive T cells most notably. And, and, in, and, and we, we know what those gas pedals and brakes are on those cells. And we have tried drugging those like typically on top of PD-1 antibody therapy. And that has almost completely systematically failed. Um, now it doesn't interestingly produce horrific toxicity. In, in other words, the immune system doesn't get so hyperactivated, like that's yeah. not the problem, uh, but it just hasn't moved the needle. Now I, I will caveat that by saying that um, those approaches have been used um, without any notion of trying to like zero in on individual patients and sets of patients for whom you know that you know, new immunologic mechanism, you know, might, was hypothesized to be uniquely suited. In other words, we've been throwing a lot of spaghetti at, at the wall and hoping things would stick by just, you know, treating like a broad array of different cancer patients with absolutely no um, molecular selection, um, even though there are uh, certainly, there, always, there were and remain hypotheses um, along those lines that, you know, were never really tested. Um, so anyway, just trying to hyperactivate T cells um, with drugs, uh, I would say we've we've kind of played that out, and it's hard to imagine the on only way to revolutionize that would be what I just alluded to, which is really, like really kind of tightening um, or, or sharpening our lens, if you will, um, and focusing on, on on applying those drugs in very specific patient populations. So beyond that, um, I really do see there's 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 what I would say a, a related class of therapies, the metabolism targeted therapies um, and epigenetic targeted therapies, which have been exploding um, in terms of understanding how you know the blueprint, uh, the genetic blueprint is sort of folded up and unfolded, um, the regulators of that, um, and the way in which cancers, um, many cancers, like need to figure out how to you know co-opt or you know take over. Um, the, the function of some of those um, folders and unfolders. Um, and so there's been a real explosion in novel, uh, very early in development drugs in that class. And it turns out, interestingly, that, that altered metabolism, so the Warburg phenomenon that you alluded to, um, and, the, and the regulators of that switch, um, those have been, become elucidated in a you know, much more complete way in, in fairly recent years. Many people would have thought, well, you can't target metabolism and get away with that, right? Because every cell in the body needs to be able to regulate its metabolism in a, you know, kind of condition-dependent way. That's true. But but cancers really do, um, they very much depend on this metabolic dysregulation. And, and we think that we're on to, you know, some of the unique regulators that cancers particularly um, co-opt. So I, I, I would pay a 
ton of attention. I mean, our group, um, in terms of our therapeutic development work, is is really quite focused in that area. Can you give us a bit more of a sense, Keith, of what that looks like? Yeah. So we we know that you know just from a glycolysis standpoint, we know cancer basically is a one trick pony. Most cancers, right? They're they're turning glucose yeah. into pyruvate all day, yeah. every day, independent yeah. of how much fatty acid is available and independent right. of how much oxygen is available and independent of, they, they, they have perfectly healthy mitochondria. Used, people used to hypothesize the mitochondria were defective, that's why they were doing it. No evidence that that's yep. the case. So yep. what, so let's just play out what you're saying. Um, you could take something really draconian and say, okay, there's an end, so we're not gonna interfere with any enzyme that turns glucose into pyruvate. That would be a bad idea because you have to do that yep. if you're healthy. Yep. But, yep. Um, so where else could you target where you disproportionately hurt a cancer cell without hurting a non-cancer cell that's undergoing glycolysis? Yeah, our group just published a paper on this topic, uh, you know, uh, it's now just five months ago, um, looking quite broadly to understand like the re these metabolic regulators um, and which ones cancers seem to selectively use. And, and interestingly, this analysis was focused on uh, immune cell recognition versus lack of recognition um, and kind of the interplay between these two things. So like, you know, we've already, we already laid out the argument of the idea that cancers, you know, it, it seems in part adopt this inefficient um, metabolic strategy because it allows them to kind of suck in, you know, available nutrients and keep them away even from immune cells. So we were trying to unpack that. And basically um, it, when you look in an unbiased way at like sort of all of the, you know, gene products that are expressed in cancer cells, um, differently than normal cells. What you see is that it's outside the mitochondria. So inside the mitochondria, I'm 100% with you. Basically, you can't poison that the factory uh, in that way. But it turns out that not only the function of mitochondria, but also just like the, the production of mitochondria. So mitochondrial biogenesis, it's called. Like there's many different mitochondria, or many, many mitochondria per cell. Different cell types, you know, need different numbers of them based on their metabolic demands. So cancer cells will actually regulate, you know, the amount of mitochondria they have um, through these outside of mitochondria, um, uh, you know, programs, if you will, uh, transcription factors in many cases that regulate, you know, kind of the, the, the program in the genome, this is the, the nuclear genome, not the mitochondrial genome, um, that regulate this process. So there's, there's some switches there. Um, and one of those switches um, basically jumped out of this analysis as like the top, you know, differentiator, if you will, um, that expressed in cancers and not, um, and others. Now it's a, it's you know, it's the type of molecule that historically has been thought to be challenging to create a drug against. Um, there actually is a proto drug against it that's you know still preclinical, but you know moving forward, we've been collaborating academically with that company, and um, and so early days in terms of knowing whether this is really going to you know kind of bear out. But but these are the types of insights we just didn't have, uh, you know, five and certainly ten years ago. Um, that that there were would be there might be ways to actually kind of laser in on. Um, the regulators of metabolism that cancers are most uh, potentially vulnerable to, and I'm not suggesting these are going to be standalone approaches, as I said before. Right. It's they're rather, stacked. they're going to potent yeah. yeah, they're going to potentiate um, these other therapies. They, and let me just kind of make this statement um, to that point. When we look at what drives resistance to both targeted therapy, so those molecules I referred to before, these you know, surface receptor and downstream molecules that have been successful and extend people's um, lives with cancer, and immunotherapy. And we, and we look at common themes in terms of resistance, this metabolic switch, like using oxidative phosphorylation when they weren't using it before, like that's a very common theme in what we call the wow. persister cell population mm. um, in, in both therapy types. And so the idea that you would then potentiate simply what we've already got, you know, right, with this class of therapies go from 20% of cancer patients having long-term survival to, you know, 40%, I'm just making that number up, um, just by figuring out this piece of the puzzle I think that's you know very much in view. Um, now we might have to toggle upstream, downstream, you know, kind of like play with where it is that we're um, ultimately poisoning this uh, you know process, um, and we may have to do it just kind of sporadic, you know, uh, periodically. Like in other words, not not constant like drug exposure all the time to be able to get away with it, which is a common theme in terms of thinking about four drug regimens for cancer. But let's come to your idea of actually um, taking advantage of this <laughs> very delicate. Um, balance, if you will, where cancer cells have, uh, have accumulated genetic alterations to a degree that's supposed to be um, intolerable for a, for a cell's survival, right? In other words, if you can't repair mutations and um, alterations that have been caused, let's say, by acute exposure to something like radiation, for example, where you get a lot of mutations all at once, we have repair mechanisms. 
But if they don't do their job, then the cell basically has a program by which it commits suicide, um, so, so-called program cell death. And basically, um, cancer cells live dangerously on the edge, if you will, um, in having accumulated these mutations um, in certain cancers, like with your friend, with Lynch. I mean, wow, the number of mutations that accumulate because of, yeah. the de- of the defective machinery is just off the charts, like ultraviolet radiation-associated skin cancers, um, also off the charts. And so, in any case, um, the point is that we know that actually if, if you introduce more mutations into those cells, like in the laboratory, like you push them over the edge. Like they just, like they, there's a limit to how much, you know, to what they can handle. So how about, you know, combining that concept with what we were talking about before, immune system recognition of mutated proteins and just say, hey, okay, like you want mutations? Again, going back to my anthropomorphic, you know, now we're talking to the cancer cell. You, you want a lot, lot, lots of mutations because it helps you, you know, dial the combination lock, if you will, and become a cancer. Fine. You know, we're going to not just double, we're going to, you know, 10x the number of mutations you have, um, both to increase immune recognition and possibly also just simply drive you towards cell cell death. Yeah. Um, That concept is really, it's behind uh, platinum-based chemotherapy's effectiveness in cancers that that are somewhat deficient in repairing their genomes. Um, So that's a a link that we've known about now therapeutically for a number of years. PARP inhibitors, uh, that's a a DNA damage repair enzyme, PARP, um, and inhibiting its function can push certain cancers that are close to the edge, if you will, over the edge. So there's already some direct evidence that we can get that benefit. The immunologic piece, um, that requires um, another layer of complexity, which is that basically you, you would need to introduce the mutations um, and, and ones that are shared across you know, the, the whole population of cancer cells, uh, or if, if not the whole, then, then nearly the whole. So the immune system actually, interestingly, is able to elaborate um, immune responses that become broader, right? So this is, you know, sort of epitope spreading, as it's called, uh, where the immune system latches onto a, a certain antigen in mounting an initial immune response, but then actually can bring in reinforcements that are recognizing um, other antigens and create a more sort of polyclonal response, what was initially a monoclonal response. Um, so uh, so that that's a, a part of innate immune function, but there's pretty good experimental evidence that you have to start with something that's at least shared in, you know, 95, 98, maybe even 99% of cancer cells. Wow. So this is where the idea of like, you know, using, let's say, radiation to treat like a single site of metastatic cancer in someone who's got 20 sites, um, we've tried this um, and it hasn't worked. I mean, there are like very sporadic cases where it actually can like trigger um, a much more profound immune response that's actually like systemic, like that goes after all the tumor sites, but that's quite rare. Again, just for folks to make sure we're following, the reason it would be rare is if you only introduce a whole bunch of mutations to 10% of the tumor, you're, you might generate a new immune response. You might yep. kick the tumor over the edge either by having so many mutations that it all undergoes program cell death, or it now finally rises to the level of detection, but that's yep. not sufficient enough. You know, for the, it won't across clear, the entire it won't clear the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It won't clear the rest of the tumors. And so, so this then you know, being a medical oncologist, you can imagine this is where my you know mind commonly goes. Then that we have to come up with a. It has to be approach. systemic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have to right. do this systemic. To, yeah. Right, and so that that's where there's some really fascinating data um, that a colleague of mine at Mass General is uh, about to publish. And it would suggest that basically you can incubate cancer cells, and by incubate I mean actually in in a living being, um, with mutation-inducing drugs, aka chemotherapy drugs, certain chemotherapy drugs. Um, but to, for that to work, you need to actually be you have to kind of pin them down with another therapy first, right? So some of the therapies we've talked about already that like actually are effective, um, you know, partially effective for a period of time, you know, months to many months in some cases before resistance might manifest to some of these targeted therapy approaches. If you pin them down with that therapy and incubate in you know, these chemotherapy drugs that basically start to dial in more and more mutations, um, at least in mouse models, um, it would appear that actually you can, you can buy the time that you need to be able to actually introduce new mutations and have that um, trigger immune recognition and make even you know, PD-1 antibody-based therapy you know, much, much more effective. Um, and so, so we're gonna try that idea in human beings, um, right? Basically taking so-called oncogene-targeted therapy, backbone treatments, um, and then using what are called alkylating agent chemotherapies, which are the ones that can in- introduce new mutations most commonly. 
Um, and, and even at somewhat low doses, it would appear, um, you potentially can introduce the mutations without having some of the deleterious effects that chemotherapy drugs are well known to cause. Thank you.